Do you, you consider, consider your GPS, GPS to be your friend or your foe? Do you humbly and eagerly and obediently follow directions? Or do you try to negotiate and find a better path on your own? I've tried arguing with my GPS, and it always responds. It says rerouting, rerouting, rerouting. And then it adds 10 minutes to my arrival time. I've learned that I do better just to trust it and take one step at a time. I wonder when you're driving down the road and you see someone in their car talking and there's no one else riding with them. Maybe they're not on their phone. Maybe they're negotiating with that GPS. Today we're thinking about our high school graduating seniors. So proud of you and the decision that you've already made at the crossroads to take the narrow road, to follow Jesus. It's not popular, the majority don't choose it, but it leads to life. And what will become in the future decisions that you make will be the result of this one choice. We see our young people all around us standing up and having a great influence regardless of their age. Yesterday, Emma and Haley at the ladies' luncheon talked about an anchor in the storm, and they know that Jesus Christ is that anchor, and we're grateful for them. At the other end of the spectrum, our dear friend and brother, Galen Roberts, what can we say about him? One of a kind, wasn't he? Many ways, inimitable and irreplaceable and unforgettable. 86 years old, married to Madeline, 64 years. Can you picture Galen as a young man? I found him. There they are. Oh, I know since that time her hair turned gray and his turned loose, but there they are. Yes. And they made a choice. There was a fork, and they went this way, God's way. And now virtually all who know Galen say he lived by faith. He loved the Lord. Whenever he came to a turn or a twist or a curve or an up or down, his GPS was already set. Such was the case with Daniel. Take out your Bible, if you would, or your phone, and turn again there to the beginning of this great, great book. You know, the world is filled with confusing signs. And it's easy to get turned around and have to go back where you started and say, if I had just done something different back then, I would be closer to my destination. Sometimes we're just overwhelmed. These voices out there from our society, from our leadership in our country, even from those that are older and should be wiser, telling us this and that and the other, so contradictory, so mixed up. And so when we think about Jesus' teaching and that decision to enter through the narrow gate, not the path that leads to destruction, but the one that has at its end everlasting life. In Daniel chapter 1, we might call the first couple of verses defeat. Do you see there as Aaron was reading, it was the third year of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And with the Lord's blessing, the king of Judah fell into his hand. And these objects, these vessels, these implements used in the holy temple built by Solomon were confiscated and taken off to Shinar, which is another word for Babylon, the primary city. It goes all the way back to Genesis. You can read about it there in chapter 10 in the Table of Nations. There were some significant events that took place during this time. In 605, Nebuchadnezzar came to power. He went against Necho, the pharaoh of Egypt, and they were battling over the city of Carchemish on the Euphrates River. Carchemish had been a village or city, a strong one actually, fortified, that belonged to ancient Assyria. And Necho of Egypt was trying to take it so that he could have more impact and control in Syro-Palestine. And that's where Nebuchadnezzar came against him. Note the name, how many kings 
were named after the deity, after the one they adored and idolized and served. And so Nabu has protected my inheritance. And whenever that name was called, it would be a reminder of his GPS, his direction, his map, where he wanted to be and whom he wanted to honor. So in 605, there is that battle where previously Assyria had ruled and now Egypt is trying to take it over, keep it under their hand. This same Necho was the one who had killed Judah's king Josiah, the father of Jehoiakim at Megiddo. When Tanya and I recently visited Jordan and Israel just a few weeks ago, we saw the plain of the Jezreel Valley and what is left of Megiddo, and we were reminded of the different rulers that established a fortress or a king digging a water tunnel there, and all the battles that took place out in that field, there's numerous ones. One of those, Josiah, went against Necho and lost his life. And so that's the way that Nebuchadnezzar, once he overcame Necho at Carchemish, took control of that whole region. And as God's tool, he came after Jerusalem. And Josiah's son, Jehoiakim, who had been placed on the throne, still in the family line of David, but just a puppet at this point, was caught and exiled. And to all appearances, it would look like the world is in control. The Jews might think we've lost. We've been overcome. We're subjugated. Even our God, Yahweh, his house is being plundered. That which was used in sacrifice and celebration and devotion to him, it's all been kind of stolen from us. It's hopeless. It's helpless. What can we do? And not only for our young people, but for all of us, when we look at our world, we see the Nebuchadnezzars. We see the Necho. We see the forces, the powers that be. We think, boy, this world is going the wrong way. We're serving God. We're trying to be faithful and true. And look what we see. What is the outcome? And we can easily feel defeated. But then we see that this Ashpenaz, the leader of all the king's eunuchs, your Bible may say officials, the Hebrew word is typically the term for eunuch, and we understand men in that condition were allowed to work near the queen in the palace. And he's told to bring into Babylon some of the sons of Israel. Notice who they are. Some of the royal family. Some of the nobles. And then look at the qualifications that are given. It's the way the world looks at people. The younger, the better. Those that have no defect. That look good on the outside. That are handsome. That are attractive. That are physically pretty. Oh, let's get the ones that are sharp. And the ones that are smart that can achieve, that can accomplish, that can do all of the things in this secular world that we tend to exalt. Oh, and if they would enhance the king's court, or if they would enhance the business, or whatever the project is, Ashmanaz, you go and you pick them out. And that one, no. That one, no. That one, yes. Because they look good. They sound good. The outside package is exactly what's going to make me as the king look good. I want us to understand that this is a totally opposite system from the way God looks at people. He sees the heart and the spirit and the faith and the character. And I want our graduates, but all of us to understand there's so many things about the outside that we can't change. We don't need to change. So many things we were given at birth or we weren't given. We're not all the same in our appearance or our ability or the things in which we can be successful. And instead of wearing ourselves out over the things that are out of our control, look at that which you can give to God so that He will make 
you beautiful. He will make you without defect. He'll make you good looking in his sight. He'll make you intelligent. He'll give you wisdom. James 1 says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God. He gives to everyone generously and without reproach. God will make you sharp and smart in his word, in the things of the spirit and the things of heaven and the things that matter on that narrow path. And just realize that there are kings out there looking for what you can do for them to promote them and lift them up and increase their power. Don't let yourself be a tool of any force on this earth that would pull you away from Jesus Christ for some other cause. There's a third D here. And that is domination. Look at the end of verse 4. What are they going to do with these young men? Teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. Appoint a daily ration, choice food and wine. Educate them for three years and then put them into the king's personal service. Do you know what Nebuchadnezzar is doing through Ashpenaz and these other influencers and teachers, those whom he's delegated. Oh, this isn't random. This is deliberate. This is personal. This is intentional. It is indoctrination. He wants to program with propaganda to brainwash, to turn these Hebrew youths into what? Babylonians, Chaldeans. What does Satan want to do with those who are young and impressionable? Those who are exposed to some ideas and priorities, maybe for the first time or in a more pronounced way than ever before? What is the world's Aim. What is its desire for clay that is still being molded and shaped and not yet fully formed? For those that are able to take in and be exposed to things that may be new to them. I believe that Daniel's situation is very similar to that which all of us face. Because the decision we make at the crossroads is a decision we make every day. But the younger we are when we genuinely make it, and the more consistently we stay with it, the more we will become like the person that Daniel became. Now, notice the tools of indoctrination. Let's send them off, away from home, Take them away from their family, maybe their home congregation, maybe the setting, the environment, which has been secure and healthy and safe and good for them. Let's transplant them into a new location with a new surrounding and new peers. Let's saturate them. Do you notice what's in this text? Did you see literature? Three years, let's have them read about our gods, our way of life, our interests, what matters to us. Did you notice language? And we're going to see in a moment the change in the names. Let's get this Hebrew out of them. That's the old way. That's their past. We don't want them stuck with this Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob stuff. This information about Yahweh that they've heard since they were born. Let's replace their vocabulary. And let's put new terms. And let's introduce them to things that will wow them and impress them. And they'll say, boy, I never heard that before. He's so scholarly. She's so smart. They must be telling me the truth. Why was I deprived of all this? 
And then let's give them leisure and luxury. Let's have a banquet for them. Hey, eat with the king. Drink with the king. We're going to make you feel good. We're going to lift you up. Life's going to be pleasant, smooth, and easy. You're going to like it here in Babylon. And you're going to want to be like all of us want to be. So more free time. Less structure. More opportunity. You don't have to follow those old rules you did back at home. That's behind you. Now, you're with us. Come to the palace. Sit at the table. Here. The best food of the land. Lifestyle. Let's show you how we operate and impress you. Hey, this is how we got to the top. We used to be subject to the Assyrians. You used to be subject to the Egyptians. Now, look who's running the world and learning. Let's put you in a classroom for three years. We will choose all your teachers. We'll choose all your textbooks. We'll choose the approach that's taken to all the issues of the day, the origin of life, the value of life, the meaning of life, the source of truth, the compass, the GPS that you should follow. Give us three years. Together, as part of this, we mentioned a moment ago, the changing of the names. Because you see, these young boys of Israel had names that reflected their allegiance to the one true God. And every time the names were called, they would hear a reminder of their creator, their savior, their king. So here's Hananiah. The word Cain in Hebrew means grace. The feminine form is Hannah. Hannah, the mother of Samuel. Her name means grace. The Yah on the end is Yahweh. Yahweh's been gracious. Hey, over there, Yahweh's been gracious. Yahweh's been... You call this young man, and you're calling on the Lord, and you're acknowledging who he is and what he's provided and his role in your life. So let's change that name to Shadrach, which means the command of Aku, the moon god. Hello, moon god. Hey, you must be the son of Aku. Hey. So what you've done is you've changed God You've changed who you are, and you've changed what people call you. And people say, hey, I'm so glad to meet you. What's your name? I'm Shadrach. Oh, you follow Aku, the moon god. Mishael. The L on the end is short for Elohim, which in the original is God. Who is what God is? It's a rhetorical question. No one. But let's call him instead Meshach. Who is this? Let's make God a nobody. Let's take him out of the sentence, out of the equation, and let's call you Meshach. Ah, and then Azariah. You may know there was a king in Judah by the same name. He's also called Uzziah. There's the Yah, Yahweh again, and Ezer is the word to help. You may know the word Ebenezer, Eben, stone, Ezra, help, a stone of help that Samuel set up. Even the name Ezra, which we studied last quarter in our Sunday Bible classes, is the same word. Yahweh has helped. Let's call him Abednego, servant of Nabu. We already said Nebuchadnezzar was named after the same deity. Some parents of young children know the trick. When they're trying to get their children tucked in at night, they tell them the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and to bed we go. Have you ever tried that? To bed we go. And, and we know these names. In fact, we keep Daniel by his Hebrew name, but these other three, for whatever reason, we rarely call them what their parents call them. Why did their mom and dad name them Hananiah? Yahweh's been gracious. Remember that when you call your name. Mishael, who is what God is? And Yahweh has helped. 
Daniel, God is my judge. Donnie means my judge, and there's the L again for God. Let's call him Belteshazzar. Belteshazzar, named after Bel, prominent god in the Babylonian empire. Bel protects his life. Domination. It's that which the world seeks to impress on those that finish high school, head out into the world or to work or to school or some new adventure or some new environment or situation. And the better we can prepare for that, the more suited we will be to do what Daniel did. And there's the D for determination. Your Bible may say he resolved or he purposed in his heart or he made up his mind. Here's a word that's used over 550 times in the Hebrew Old Testament. It's a word that means to put or to place. It could be you're laying something on a table. It could be you're installing a new piece of equipment or you're establishing, you're arranging, you're fixing an item so it can't be moved. Daniel fixed himself. Daniel aligned himself. He planted himself. That is this word. I want you to think for a moment as you look at verse 8, not to eat of the king's food or to take his drink as well, not to defile himself. Some might say this isn't that major of a thing, you know. Daniel, you don't want this to be the hill that you die on. Pick your battles. Why don't you just kind of go along with the flow a little bit? That way you can stay in the court and you can do something bigger and better down the road. Why don't you just go along? It's that kind of peer pressure. Not just teenagers and young adults, but every one of us in this room. Hey, just drink a little. Just try this. A bit of it won't hurt you. Come on, you'll fit in, you'll belong. You don't want to look strange. You don't want to sound different. You don't want to say no when everybody else is doing it. What was it about Daniel, who, by the way, is one of the four, but apparently he's the leader of the four, the spokesman for them all? And let me be sure to say that Daniel has good peer pressure from Hananel, Mishael, and Azariah. We think of Daniel as standing alone and speaking up, but think about the team. Think about the people he associated himself with. Someone said when you choose your friends, you choose your future. And by the way, we don't know the parents of these young men. But we know that something was instilled in them which says that little things can be a big thing and can lead to a path, a fork in the road, a different GPS, a turn at the crossroads that's not the one that puts God first. It's quite likely, since the Hebrew text said he didn't want to defile himself, that this food had been offered to idols. And the best of the best were Bel or Marduk or Nabu. And then you know the idols don't eat much. You ever think about that? So what was cooked for them, we then served to the king. Tasty, delicious, well prepared by the best chefs in the land. But because of the connection with idolatry, Daniel said, no. The king's wine, perhaps Daniel was wise to avoid wine anyway. If this wine was used as some libation poured out over a Babylonian offering, that would have been an additional reason. Peter wrote in his first letter, if you turn to chapter 1, verse 13, he wrote to Christians who have left the nest. 
who are away from home, who are sojourners, pilgrims, strangers. We can even use that word, aliens, in a foreign land in this world. And here's what the scripture says. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Get dressed for action. Be ready. Set your hope fully on the grace to be brought to you in the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And be holy yourselves in all your behavior because it's written, you shall be holy for I, the Lord, am holy. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go through these because I want to get to verse 21. There's a dilemma. It's not on Daniel's part. It's the eunuch. Oh, no, no, no. The king will have my head if I exempt you from the required indoctrination diet. And then there's deliberation where Daniel says, hey, let's have a test. Why don't you try this with the four of us and see what happens? There's deliverance where God provides the blessing and they do better than all the others. And then there is that distinction. Look at verses 17 through 20. And you can see that uh, uh, God uh, continues to set them apart uh, so that... Um, Verse 20, every matter of wisdom and understanding, the king would consult them, and they were ten times better than all the others. But I want to come to verse 21, and I want to challenge our young people to be a Daniel. And I want to challenge myself and every one of us as well to purpose in our heart. Here's my question. Chapter 6, Daniel faces the lions. How old was he? Don't have to raise your hand. How many of us think he was about 25? Don't, under 40? He was at least 80 years old, maybe 90. Because you see, he continued to serve into the time of Darius. And for that to be the case, he most likely was a teenager. A teenager when he purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the food or the wine. He may have lived to be a hundred years old. This picture was given to me by Adam and Alicia Thackeray when Tanya and I first came to this wonderful church. It's been on the wall of my office ever since. I told Tanya, I'm going to take a picture of that because I want to remember if I get to be whatever age I am, whatever age I will be, why did Daniel become that old man? Why did Galen Roberts become the man he was at 86? Same reason. And so that distance that he may have lived to be 100 years old in the reign of Darius I want to close with this. This is a song that's not in our books. It's not even a screen, paperless hymnal song. But it's a beautiful song. Dare to be a Daniel. Standing by a purpose true, heeding God's command, honor them, the faithful few, all hail to Daniel's band. Many mighty men are lost. They didn't dare to stand. Who for God they could have been a host by joining Daniel's band. Many giants, great and tall, stalking through the land, headlong to the earth would fall if they were met by Daniel's band. Hold the gospel banner high, on to victory grand, Satan and his hosts defy and shout for Daniel's band. And here's the chorus. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm. Dare to make it known. The Lord's invitation for those that are already in Christ is to look again at our resolve, our backbone, our courage. Go back to the GPS, see if we need to make a different turn somewhere. And it is for those that are not yet in Christ to be baptized into Christ. Romans 6, 1 through 4 dying to sin, buried with them in watery grave, and then coming forth once more. If you'd respond to the invitation, it's open for you. Shall we stand and sing?